Welcome you again to another in this ongoing series of the Ancient Scripture Department's uh, Book of Mormon Roundtables. Uh, with me today are three of my friends and colleagues. To my left is uh, Professor Keith Wilson. Nice to have you with us, Keith. Thanks. And to his left is Professor Gay Strathern. Thank you, Gay, for being with us. And to her left is Professor Charles Swift. It's uh, wonderful to be with you today and to have the opportunity to discuss at some length at Alma chapter 31 and 32. Perhaps just to get us started and to put this into perspective, we just remind ourselves that in the previous chapter, uh, we've discussed Korahor, who has uh, been uh, trampled to death among, of all people, the Zoramites, who we'll talk about for a few moments here as we begin. And uh, it seems to me that uh, this result may not say quite as much as it does about Korahor as it does about the Zoramites and their complete, uh, I guess, disregard for what they would consider inferior people, which we can talk about. Anything else about the uh, this incident with Korahor and the Zoramites we want to touch upon as we launch into chapter 31? One of the things that I think here is that we have, <coughs> Korahor comes along and he makes a, a, a big splash and big impact, but he, he comes off the scene very quickly. He dies quickly. But the philosophies that he's teaching continue to linger. You can get rid of the man quickly, maybe, but you can't get rid of the philosophies. We're going to see elements of his teaching amongst the Zoramites. Those people who trampled him to death are actually going to be an example of the people who live the kind of philosophy that he was teaching. We're also going to see it with Corianton, and we're going to see it at the end of Helaman um, with the people there. So the philosophy is going to move on um, throughout the Book of Mormon, not just uh, it doesn't die with Corrie Hall. With Corrie Hall. Thank you. Now, with with this beginning, we've got a, we've got quite a missionary district here. At least I like to refer to it as a missionary district. They're they're going to go among the Zoramites, and you've got uh, Alma and Ammon and Aaron and uh, Ominer. Him nice stays back to take care of the government, and then you've got uh, a couple of great uh, converts, uh, Amulek and Zeezrom, and then a couple of Greenies, I guess, with uh, uh, Corianton and Shiblon. Uh, but uh, what's the, uh, be a great missionary group to serve with, I would think, but what's the process or the approach they're going to take here? Well, they're really worried that the Zoramites that have kind of broken away and have their own little colony, that they might run off and join up with the Lamanites and, and bring back more bloodshed and turmoil. And, but uh, rather than go out and force them back in, uh, as people that have left the fold, uh, Alma says there in verse 5, Now as the preaching of the word had a great tendency to lead the people to do that which was just, yea, it had more powerful effect upon the minds of the people than the sword or anything else which had happened, and then this great line, Therefore Alma thought it was expedient that they should try the virtue of the word of God. Uh, he, he, he just uh, sets forth their method the Word of God will do more to change somebody than going out, forcing them into correct behavior, using the sword, uh, even if they're going against uh, uh, principles of freedom or whatever else they were, they were combating here. When you think about these missionaries, what they've been doing in the past, they, they, they know about this. Absolutely, because wasn't it the sons of Mosiah, they laughed at them when they said yeah. that they wanted to go out and they said specifically, we just need to battle them and that's how we'll get rid of them. Yeah. But Ammon and his brethren thought, no, there's power in the word and Alma's going to have that same yeah. experience. The only time we've converted Lamanites is when we've preached the gospel to them or seen power among others that go away. It's, it's uh, important. <laughs> That, uh, that statement in verse 5 there of Alma 31 really resonates with uh, President Packer's great statement uh, where he taught true doctrine understood changes attitudes and behaviors. The study of the doctrines of the gospel will improve behavior quicker than a study of behavior will improve behavior. Great. Thank you. Excellent uh, point. Now we look at uh, the, what, what do we know about the Zoramites, their, their beliefs and some of their practices, we could quickly summarize that. We don't want to spend too much time here, but... Uh, well, real quickly, I think it's important to note that before we get to their practices, we got to look at what it is they did that caused them to fall into those false practices. Okay. And so you see in verse 9, there were two problems they had. Verse 9, they quit observing the commandments of God and His statutes. And in verse 10, they quit continuing in prayer and supplication 
that they wouldn't enter into temptation. So quit keeping the commandments, quit praying for the Lord's help to help them overcome temptation, and then all of these other practices, I think, fall out of that. Thank you. So now, what do we know about their, their practices? They actually do pray, but, but uh, we would probably say sort of, but what are, what are their religious practices and habits and beliefs here, just quickly? What do we see with them here? Well, they have a ramiumpton, and I think that that's important. Uh, they want to be seen of men. They yeah. want to be seen to be religious. In other words, it's a kind of a going up, look at me, look how, yeah. how religious I am in terms of my prayers. And then the prayers are not from the heart, which is a big contrast to the prayer later on we see with Alma. Yeah. But it, it's, it's a set prayer, look how wonderful I am. God has yeah. chosen me, aren't I wonderful? Yeah. Chosen us, and yeah. we're the favorite people. The and elect people. So a set prayer, a set place, you see, you start thinking about that notion, and only one person can do it at a time. Right. And so, in reality, if you don't do it up there, the one person you don't ever pray, and the rest of the week you wouldn't pray either. So you're right, really, there's not much going on for them. And it's very clear, too, <clears throat> that there's only certain of the Zoramites can do it, right? That's but correct. In the next chapter, that not everybody can do it, only the elect yeah. people can do well, it. Well, also, and they're very, in verse 24, they're very materialistic. Their yeah. hearts are set on gold and silver and fine yeah. goods. So they've relegated the poor, they, they kind of persecute the poor and, and trod them down, and, uh, and they worship weekly, and I spell that two ways, W-E-E-K mm -hmm. and W-E-A-K-L-Y. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, and uh, also their doctrines, a couple of doctrines they've got here that we see that are uh, obviously off base. God is a spirit. Yeah. So be no Christ. And there be no Christ. So Which with is all very Corey Horish. Yeah, right? that's right. So with all of this that we see, and, and we could talk about other things, but now the challenge is you think, here you are with your, with your missionaries that you're going to go in and try to reach these people. And you see, you've got your work cut out for you. Uh, we don't have time to read all of this, but from verse 26 over to verse 35 is Alma's prayer, right. pleading with the Lord. And I, I'd like to have us just focus on uh, verse 31 and maybe 33, where Alma in praying says, O Lord, wilt thou grant unto me that I may have strength that I may suffer with patience these afflictions which shall come upon me because of the iniquity upon this people, or of this people. And then verse 33, for his brethren grant them that they may bear with their afflictions which shall come upon them because of the iniquities of this people. When you try to help people who are deep in sin, often they make it very hard for you. They're not very receptive, they're angry. And I think we see that as we try to help people who've fallen away and got deep into sin. Sometimes they're not responsive. They're angry. They, they lash out, and Alma just knows. And, and yet the motive for doing this, he says in verse 35, is... Their souls are precious. Yeah. Yeah. They, th these, are, these were our brethren. Help us. So you can see his motive is we're not trying, to, we're not trying for any right. fame. We just want to bless these people. Well, uh, a, a great challenge now that's going to be ahead of them. We come to chapter 32, and... And right off the bat, uh, we see uh, they're going to do what? What's, what's their approach again now that they're going to use, as it says here in the first couple of verses? To bring them the word. Yeah, we're going to preach the word. Now, why, why are we, uh, again, we've got preaching the word, and who are they going to have success among? Those who are in preparation <clears throat> to hear it. Yeah, and in this case, that turns out to be pretty much... The poor people who couldn't participate in the religious rituals um, because they, they were too poor. They had helped to build the Rami Upton, they'd helped to build their churches, but because they're poor, they're not allowed in there. And they're thinking, well, how can I pray? How can I be religious yeah. if I can't go to church? And, and so Alma recognizes that as that they have questions for him. And whenever we've got somebody who's got a question, they're going to listen to an answer. Yeah. And so he's just going to turn and concentrate on them because he has a captive audience. Yeah. Now, Alma says, I, I like this. He says that there are two ways to be humble. We'll go back and pick some other things. But he said there's two ways to be humbled here, starting with verse 13 and going down to verse 16. And most of us, I think, choose the first way, which is we become humbled by our circumstances, which is what had happened with those Zoramites. They're they're uh, being kind of cast off and looked at second-class people and couldn't go to the, you know, they, they were in a readiness because of their humbleness. But the real, the best way, as Alma says, is if we would be, verse 14, humbled because of the word. And, uh, and so I think there's a lesson for us to learn here. It's a lot like the Beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit. Yeah. Know, who've come unto me. Good point, good point. Well, now, uh, so as you look at this chapter and we, and we talk about this, I, I think um, often people look at this as a chapter on faith, and, and it can be that. I did a word count once just because I had a little uh, curiosity for myself, and I found the word faith is used 17 times in this chapter, but I found that the word 
word is used 18 times. In reality, this is a chapter about having faith in the word. Right. And that will lead us to a discussion of both of these very important principles. But um, so uh, what, what else has impressed you in, in this, the early part of this chapter that we want to talk about uh, concerning their, uh, the, the missionary work here and the use of the word? Anything you'd like hey, to share you, with us? Why don't you tackle the concept of the word? Right, because he says in 28, we will compare the word unto the seed. It's not specifically faith, it's the word. So the question is, what is the word? Um, and while there are many definitions and ways that we can understand that, Alma himself gives us some important keys about how he's understanding what he means when he's talking about the word. Uh, let me kind of just run through them with you. Verse 16 is his first kind of use of it. Therefore, blessed are ye who humble themselves without being compelled to be humble, as you were talking about before. Or rather, in other words, blessed is he that believeth in the word of God and is baptized without stubbornness of heart, yea, without being brought to know the word or even compelled to know before they will believe. So here is, is, is the word of God that he wants to liken to the seed, is the ability to want to listen to it and to be baptized, the gospel, in other words, mm -hmm. participate in the gospel. I think the second one is up in verses 22 and 23. Uh, at the end of verse 22, he says, He desireth in the first place that ye sh should believe, yea, even on his word. And now he imparteth his word by angels unto men. Yea, not only unto men, but unto women also. Now this is not all. Little children do have the words given unto them many times, which confound the wise of the learned. So here we've got another interpretation of word. It's revelation that is going to come from God. That's one of the words that we can compare to a seed. Next one's down in verse 26. Now, as I said concerning faith, that it is not to have a perfect knowledge, even so it is with my words. You cannot know of their surety at first unto perfection any more than faith is a perfect knowledge. So here his words are something that we should compare to a seed, the words of the prophets. Lastly, and perhaps I think most importantly, is in chapter 33. So we're skipping over a little bit, and this is the end of his, his um, teaching to the Zoramites. It's down in verse uh, 22 and 23, and he's talking about being cast off. If you don't want to be cast off, then um, cast your eyes round about and begin to believe in the Son of God, that he will come to redeem his people, that he shall suffer and die to atone for their sins, and that he shall rise again from the dead, which shall bring to pass the resurrection, that all men shall stand before him to be judged at the last and judgment day according to their works. And now, my brethren, I desire that ye shall plant this word in your hearts. So it's ultimately, those other ones are kind of subsections, but ultimately the word that we need to compare to the seed and plant in our hearts is the, the atonement of Jesus Christ, um, his resurrection and, his, and the judgment. The centrality of Christ. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, chapter 34, verse 5, uh, just corroborates that even yeah. further, that the great question which is in your minds is whether the word be in the Son of God yeah. or whether there shall be no Christ. So it's really faith in Christ that he's yeah. talking yeah. about yeah. In, yeah. Our, in, the, in the great discourse here. Good point. Well, anything else about faith now we want to, before we start pursuing this? Well, of course, with, with verse 21, if that's okay to Please. talk about that Please now. Do. I just love the way he begins defining it by saying what it's not. And of course, uh, he doesn't just choose any number of things that it's not, but he chooses the one thing that people who are going to be opposed to people of faith will claim that faith ought to be. You know, faith is not to have a perfect knowledge of things. I remember someone s c cornering me one day and just saying, you know, you Mormons, you can't prove, and he listed a number of things we couldn't prove. You can't prove this, you can't prove that, you can't prove that, you can't prove that, you can't prove that. And I just stood there, and then when he was all done, I just looked at him and said, you're absolutely right, that's why it's called faith. And he just paused and he said, you're right. And so we don't have to apologize for the fact that we don't have the kind of knowledge that many people claim we have to have to know something, because we're talking about faith here. And it's, if you have faith, you hope for things which you're not seeing, which are true. So, Thank you. As you said, the remarkable thing about the rest of this chapter is he's going to propose a way that one can not only acquire, but, but to build that faith, which is using an experiment. That there is a way that you can come and line upon line, you can grow and increase that, that faith. And it doesn't have to be something that you're you know, blind 
yeah. obedience. It's it's based upon things that you do and the results that you get, which are evidences of things not seen. Yet you don't have the perfect knowledge, but you do have knowledge, and it's come because you've applied the principles. So. So I think faith is not the first principle of the gospel because somehow we start with faith and then somehow we get to a point where we don't need it anymore. And I don't think that that's what Alma's teaching here. Faith is an integral part of knowledge, included in knowledge. They're not not dichotomies. They're they're very much a part of things. In fact, Joseph Smith taught in his lectures on faith that all things which relate to life and godliness are the effects of faith. In, In other words, you could look at faith as being kind of the nexus Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is the nexus of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everything flows through it. It's not like you build on it. Uh, go ahead, Charles. You're well, I was just going to say, I don't know of anyone. To me, if, if you're going to be someone who denies faith and says that, that I'm going to live a life without faith, then you have to, you have to take out any, everything in life that's worth, uh, that makes life worth living. Because you can't, you can't prove love that you have for people or that people have for you. You can't prove freedom, you can't prove justice. All the things that that we value in life are things that at some level we first start by taking it on faith. You know, I love the parallels of verse 21. Uh, Faith is not to have a perfect knowledge of things, wherefore you hope for things which are not seen which are true, with two other prophets' statements. Uh, Moroni in Ether 12, verse 6, gives largely the same verse. Mm -hmm. You receive no witness until after the trial of your faith. Talks about you you can't see this, this is something you apply. And then Paul in his great discourse on faith in Hebrews. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So there's amazing parallels, but Alma outdoes them all in terms of the depth he brings us to. Well, and, and I love it the way it ends in verse 21, which are true. Yeah. So if you hope for things which are not seen, which are not true, then it's not faith. Yeah. You, know, you can call it superstition or something else, but it's got to be true yeah, if you have faith. The, the thought that's often occurred to me here is he sets up a paradox. He says, you have to really be a good guesser. So how is it that you can hope for things uh, which are true but and put trust in them without knowing that they're true. And really, he answers that paradox now mm-hmm. as he goes through these steps that he takes yeah, his the research. experiment that one can mm-hmm. do. And that, uh, that, in other words, you don't, you just, you take one step, you get this result, you take another step, you get this result, and as you continue, it's like you have those evidences that come step by step until it comes to the perfect day, and, and you now know many, many things uh, rather than still just, uh, you know, starting from the little yeah. kind of kernel of faith that you begin with here. Well, and I like the idea of <clears throat> let's experiment upon this in a, in a number of ways, but one of my favorite is the fact that he's not sitting with a group of people who are struggling to have faith and trying to commit them to doing something for the rest of their lives. But he's saying, will you experiment on this? Will you give this a try? Let's just see how it happens. Let's see how it goes. And after a certain period of time, we'll <clears throat> we'll reevaluate and, and see what you've learned from it. And so when you have someone come to you who uh, is questioning the gospel or, or struggling in their testimony, sometimes, if the Spirit directs you to do so, sometimes it's a matter of, well, will, will you read with me for a couple of weeks in the Book of Mormon? And, and will yeah. you read it from your heart? And Let's just do this experiment. And they'll say, well, I'm willing to do that. I'm, I'm not going to read it for the rest of my life, but I'll do it for a couple of weeks. Yeah. And then at the end of the couple of weeks, sometimes they find that that's all they needed. He, he describes some of the results we could anticipate here, doesn't he? Mm-hmm. What, what, I mean, what are some of the kinds of things that we might, if we were looking, all right, so what could I expect? And, and uh, while this is not exhaustive, it surely gives us all a right. variety of things that one might uh, expect to have happen, especially over here in verse 28. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and I love how metaphorical it is because it doesn't narrow it down to one type of experience. That's right. But one of my favorite first steps is this. Now, if you give place that a seed may be planted in your heart. So the, the thing you've got to do is just give room in your heart for the Lord to plant the seed. Yeah. If you just be willing to do that. Yeah. So when the person reads, as you said, if they really will read and consider what's there genuinely, not just you know pass your eyes over the page right. and say you're done, but really take the time to read this for what it is and, and examine it honestly and seriously for a month or two weeks or three months, whatever the experiment is and then anticipate some other things that'll happen here. Yeah, in fact, it's, it's a great tutorial here as he says, it's kind of like the gospel is inductive in its approach to learning. Right. He says, you've got to be willing to try this. This and is an verse, experience. Yeah, that verse 27, if you'll awake and arouse your faculties, it's kind of his second big point here. First you hope, then you awake and arouse them. Sounds an awful lot like the Savior statement, if any man will do his will, 
he shall know it. You've got to be willing to experiment. I, I love the idea that it's, this is a new way of learning, and it's not just cognitive. You have to experience something. It's kind of like a contrast with core horse. Sorry, go ahead. No, 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 that's all right. I was just thinking I, that, that idea here is that I love that it, the description of that it begins to swell mm -hmm. within your breast. Um, I think that that's what Ammon was having when we were talking about all of that joy that they yeah, had. Yeah. That's that swelling, that's an enlarging. I've had experiences in my lifetimes when I've just gone along and I've just been busy doing things in the church. And we, we all have that experience. But just that overwhelming feeling of life is wonderful. Yeah. It is great. Right. The gospel yeah. of Jesus Christ works, and that's that kind of swell. Now it can start in small ways, yeah. but but it's going to build and build and build. So it's just that that feeling from, from within of how wonderful the gospel is. And, and enlightening our understanding, where we just think, oh my goodness, so many more things now are coming together and make sense when I know this and this about the gospel. And we've talked about the missionaries previously who were teaching, you know, the plan and and uh, creation and the fall and putting it all together, and they can just see you know, the connection to before and after. It's like you've taken the blinders That's off right. and you begin to see this. And, 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 it's, and it also, it's delicious. It's right. like, boy, this just, this, this is just, it's like something I've, I should have known all along and it feels good to you. And, uh, yeah. you know, Clyde, embedded within this is the fact that he's teaching us here about the spirit. This is almost mm -hmm. like the third mm -hmm. step. The mm -hmm. first is is we hope on something that's really true, not just pie in the sky, but really mm -hmm. true. Then we're willing to experiment on that principle or whatever it is that we're hoping mm -hmm. for. And then in verse 28, he says, now you're going to catch these impressions of the Spirit. Because exactly. he says the Word is the Spirit of the Lord right in the middle of the verse right. there. And then he tells, just like you've identified, he gives us three ways that we'll experience the Spirit working on us. Sometimes in the church we talk about the Spirit being little pins poking us or you're on fire inside. That's so hard to, to relate with those descriptions because, you know, fire usually burns you and things and, you, and, and things. But here is just an uh, on-hand expression of the Spirit working to enlarge kind of the swelling motions, to enlighten the thoughts that come to your mind, and to bring, be delicious or the peaceful feeling, which is, I think, the most common element. And, and I think that verse of it itself is just a sermon within a sermon right. in terms of what you'll feel when you feel the Spirit. And it even tells you what you have to be sure not to do. How will the experiment will mess up? And it'll be if you do not cast it out by your unbelief. So you've just got to be willing to let your heart be open, let it be planted, and don't cast it out. You've got to suspend your unbelief for this experiment. Or the danger with some, we see this missionary, you have people who are, you, you teach them the, you know, the first discussion or whatever, and they're so excited and you know they feel good about it, and, and, and yet they're not willing to go on further right. and do right. something else, and then all of a sudden they just kind of fall away, and yet you know, and they would honestly know they did feel something. They felt these things here. Yeah, sure. But but like he says here, now what you have is your faith perfect. Well, yes, in this one thing, this this word we've given to you is good, but you don't have a perfect knowledge yet, and if you don't do anything with this, it'll soon fade, and you'll, you may even forget or, or even yeah. deny that you ever had that knowledge, and so that's so important. Yeah, those impressions come, but if you don't act on them, they'll leave you. Right. You know, and many yeah. of us have seen investigators, and even ourselves, you know, when we don't, the Spirit kind of withdraws if you don't honor that, that impression of the Spirit. Well, and you know, and people will sometimes say, you know, you hear people say, how can I stand up and say I know the Church is true, or I know the Book of Mormon is true, if I don't know it? If I, if, and what they're thinking is, is this idea of I can't know unless I see. Mm -hmm. And in verse 34, it's interesting because Alma defines what faith is, but he also defines what perfect knowledge is. And he says, and now behold, is your knowledge perfect? And, and you're thinking the answer is going to be, well, no, it's not perfect. And he says, yea, your knowledge is perfect in that thing, and your faith is dormant. And so we have people of other faiths who may be frustrated with us when we say, I know the Church is true, or I know the Book of Mormon is true, and they'll say, well, no, 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 you just believe it. No, belief, belief is verse 21. That's faith. I, I believe the Book of Mormon was true before the Spirit bore witness, but now that the Spirit bore witness, I know it's true. I have a perfect knowledge that it's and true. And see, that's so different from what Corihor was teaching. Right. For Corihor, you had to see, touch, and feel. But for Alma, so they have a, he has a very different epistemology of what knowledge is, but for him it is to be your understanding doth begin to be enlightened and your mind doth begin to expand. That for him is knowledge. It's right. not the seeing, touching, feeling, but it's just as real and just as powerful for Alma as Corrie Hall thought his ways of knowing were. That's why we can say, I know it's true. Well, how do you know it? Because the Spirit's told me. 
And if you don't think the Spirit told you, then you can say, I have faith that it's true, and I'm going to work with that. But then he shows you that you're involved in a process, too. Your, your knowledge is perfect of that thing. Right. But then he says, in the next verse, 36, he says, but it's not completely you perfect. Still need and faith. he says, yeah, you still need faith. And then he talks about the next step, which I think we often uh, undervalue quite uh, frequently in our faith paradigm, and that is the nourishing phase. Mm -hmm. the, that the Lord wants us to, to stay the course. And sometimes we go for periods where we don't feel lots of feedback from the Spirit. And, and, and that's when we have to have the, the, the trust in the process that the Lord will still reward us with knowledge, perfect knowledge even, but that we have to, to nourish it and, uh, and, uh, and to just take care of this, of this growing faith. I'm going to ask Gay now to kind of, as we're coming to the close here, to kind of wrap this up and tie in really the, the ultimate rewards here and uh, give us a little summary of what we've been discussing here, particularly with Alma. One of the things that I often wonder about here and as I talk with my students is why do you think that Alma chose this metaphor of a seed? And they'll often tell me, well, it's because they were farmers and, and they knew that kind of experience. And, and I think that that is true at a certain level. But I think that there's something else going on here. Um, the, se the point of this metaphor is not the seed, but it's the tree and the fruit that comes from the tree. And so down in verse uh, 39, now, this is not because the seed was not good, etc., etc. the ground was barren, verse 40. And thus, if you will not nourish the word, looking forward with an eye of faith to the fruit thereof, you can never pluck from the fruit of the tree of life. This isn't any tree. This is the tree of life and the fruit that comes from that. And one of the things as I look at the language here, that um, Alma is going to describe the fruit of this tree in verse 42 as most precious. We don't see that very often in the scriptures. But the other two places that we find it is when we're talking about Lehi's vision of the tree of life and Zenos' allegory um, of um, the, the scattering. And then he describes it as sweet above all that is sweet. And again, that language only comes from Lehi's vision. So what, what's, Al, what's Alma trying to get the Zoramites here to understand? I think he's, again, the Zoramites know the scriptures. They were once Nephites. What he's trying to say is, remember the tree of life vision. You're a part of this. You once held on to that rod of iron. You may have wandered and got caught in the mists of darkness. But if you come back, come back and hold on to that rod all will be well. Likewise, you Zoramites are covenant people. You have been um, scattered off because of the choices that you've made, but come back. God wants you to come back to the covenant so he can bless you with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's his hope and his dream for the Zoramites. Specifically coming back to that tree yes. and namely Jesus Christ. Absolutely. Uh, the faith in the word. Thank you very much.